Hare Krishna, Bhakti Sanat Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining the Monks Podcast once again. In longing to have you. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's a pleasure to be back again with you. It's been a long time. Yes, Maharaj. So, Maharaj today I thought we could discuss on a topic uh, which uh, I feel is not highlighted sufficiently. That is, so the importance of the oral tradition in preserving and propagating spiritual culture. So the background I, I just give why I thought about this is many devotees have told me that during this COVID time they had sometimes a lockdown or whatever, they had time to study scriptures. But they said somehow we don't have taste for studying. We study, we study for some time and then we get bored or we just can't connect with it. But in comparison that hearing, a lot of devotees are hearing. So then a couple of devotees, I had done a issue of Nishat and Nectar of Instruction as a part of my Bhakti Shastri, where uh, online course when I had done, I had divided Prabhupada's purport into paragraphs. And each paragraph I had made one slide and explained that. So I said, uh, so I told them that, you know, you can try this out. And many devotees told me that this was very helpful. And they said that, that I, actually, if we are reading something and hearing something together, then the understanding becomes much, much more. Just reading alone doesn't... Uh, it is not so easy to understand things. So then I, I I was just thinking and reading in general about religious history. So overall, it seems that the books were not available till a few hundred years ago. And whether it is in India or whether it is in, say, in the Europe, where there was a biblical tradition, it was mostly reading. It was mostly hearing. <laughs> so spiritual <laughs> knowledge was... Uh, propagated primarily through hearing. And uh, so I also appreciate Prabhupada's farsightedness in ensuring that there's a Bhagavatam class every single day. Even when he mentions that, even in his purport, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. So, so Prabhupada himself did emphasize the oral tradition. Although, say, we may not talk about it. We enact it in a sense in our class, in our movement. But sometimes I felt Discussing about its relevance and its uh, back, its context can help us appreciate it more. Yeah, yeah. I think the reason, and, and we see that in our uh, Krishna conscious tradition also, apart from the larger Vedic tradition and also the global tradition actually. Because in the different cultures and philosophies of the world, there has been a primacy that has been accorded to sound. You know, and uh, uh, in the beginning there was the word, right? That's what oh, the Bible also yeah, says. Yeah. Uh, in the Vedas also it is Shabda. You know, everything, the, the creation of the Panchatat, uh, of the uh, Mahabhutas and all that starts with, uh, uh, you know, Shabda, sound. It all comes from sound originally. The Tanmatras and then the Mahabhutas. So sound is the origin of everything. And um, uh, the Omkara came, uh, you know, the, the uh, vibration of the flute of Krishna, the Omkara, the vibration of the Vedic syllables. Yes. You know, it's all um, based on sound vibration. So because sound is considered divine, right, in the Vedic understanding. In yes. general, sound is considered divine. And the alphabets are imperishable. Therefore, the Sanskrit word for alphabets is akshara, a and kshara, right? Kshara means that which is destroyed and a is not. Mm. So because the syllables are essentially indestructible and sound inherently has a, a divine nature, all the more when it is uh, the glorification of the Supreme Lord, so in the devotional paramparas also a lot of importance is given to uh, oral transmission. Hmm. Process of actually hearing, right? <clears throat> yes, Maharaj. So when we say the syllables are imperishable, uh, what does it exactly mean? At one level, we know that there are uh, there is the spiritual wisdom that is there, that is eternal, but what does syllables itself being imperishable mean? 
is it because with respect to language you know there are three things there is like the written script in which are the languages are written then there is the phonetics the way we articulate those and then there is the underlying concept so the concept the uh, the verbal articul the, the audio articulation and then the written artic written depiction of that so are we saying that when we say aksharas are imperishable what does it mean exactly because it comes directly from the supreme lord uh so sound therefore being uh is is a transcendental energy uh um, so so the word for example the first akshara the first swara is vowel is a oh yes the a you know is there everywhere it's all over right in any language the word a has to be there a has to be there so the overall uh shall we say the quality of the sound is imperishable the sound cannot be destroyed and also imperishable in the sense that it is through sound that the imperishable knowledge or transcendence is um uh, embodied and communicated and also because it is non different from the source of the sound now that yes, non difference in that sense yes, but the non difference applies specifically to sounds related with krishna isn't it that's what we often say differentiates between uh, ordinary syllables or, or ordinary sound and sounds related so the holy name mm. yes uh, you know it's a question of perception and the consciousness of the perceiver like for example uh prabhupad says that um there is actually no difference between spiritual and material when uh one is at a certain plane of consciousness but when one is not at that plane of consciousness then there is a distinction that needs to be made between the spiritual and the material so when one is on a certain plane of consciousness which is of pure devotion then everything that one speaks uh will have some transcendental import okay and uh so the the the, the say messages about krishna are also you know transcendental sound vibrations you know so we may be explaining the holy name in in some language may not be sanskrit it could be any language but that's still considered transcendental sound vibration right so because it is glorification of the supreme lord it's considered transcendental so what what will distinguish sound from being material or spiritual uh, is not only its ontological um, shall we say uh, identity but also the intention behind which those sounds are being uttered and the consciousness of the person who is uh uh vibrating those sounds yes so that means there is both a there is at some level like a intrin there is an intrinsic divinity to sound but there is also we so we could say something like a contextual manifestation of that divinity depending on who is speaking and in what consciousness so the holy name at one level is non different from krishna but at the same time depending on who is chanting the holy name that non difference will be perceived to different degrees based on the consciousness the like krishna says yatha mam prapadyante so tam sathaiva badam bajamme ham so depending on our consciousness krishna reveals himself so can we put it that way then that means akshara so at one level the syllables are all at one level every sound itself as you said is a transcendental energy so the syllables that convey sound they are also transcendental but on another level depending on how they are used and for what purpose they are used that transcendence will be manifested yes similarly to music you know the notes of music like sa re ga ma pa da ni sa prabhupad makes a mention of that in our purport that the original um, reason for 
the swaras to be generated is for the glorification of the supreme lord the same swaras by swaras i mean here the uh, sare gama pad and the notes so when they are employed for materialistic purposes then uh, they lose their divinity but when these ragas are employed they originally meant for that so in that sense you can say these uh, swaras or these notes are divine but because they used for something that is not divine then they also acquire the character of non divinity so essentially it's it's the the consciousness of the uh, person involved that really makes the distinction between divinity and non divinity and uh perishability imperishability you know all these ideas okay. so when there is a certain uh objectivity uh to the reality of of the world but there is a strong element of subjectivity there also okay because uh, depending on one subjective uh frame of mind or consciousness then one sees something as separate from krishna right prabhu par defined uh, materialistic consciousness is that uh, which is which sees things separate from krishna yeah. so that would apply to the sounds the syllables of sound of the alphabet it would apply to the notes of music it could apply to everything essentially okay so now you are mentioning this in connection with the oral tradition so what you are saying is that the oral tradition's importance is universal because the oral tradition is the medium by which that divine sound is transmitted from speaker to the audience was that the connection broadly yes yes the reason the oral tradition has uh, remained uh, such a strong influence in not just the vedic tradition but the global tradition is uh, as i said earlier the primacy that has been accorded to sound sound vibration now one could say that that's because we didn't have paper you know so there was no paper to put things down um uh, well you know that's that's a kind of a, a modern understanding um the kind if if you look at the quality of uh the the philosophy and the texts in the vedic scriptures it's hard to imagine that the sages of the past were not capable enough of devising some means of putting things down in writing yes it's hard to imagine that they were so backward that they didn't have some form of material on which to write okay mm. so even if they didn't have paper as we know it today but there were palm leaves and and even otherwise they could have uh devised some um you know tangible substances on which they could write but i think the point is that they considered that an inferior means of transmission of knowledge they they considered uh the oral transmission to be superior for various reasons so therefore despite the fact that they had the intelligence and capability to devise the writing materials like paper and ink and whatever else they preferred to maintain the oral tradition because of its uh, uh power because of its sanctity because of its utility right because of its divinity that's beautifully put okay so what you are meaning to say is that uh, there is uh, so in, in the past we know that people's consciousness was more evolved and kaliyuga we have the understanding of the degradation of uh, of uh, human capacities so so writing was considered to be at one level not only unnecessary but also in one sense you said undesirable in the sense that inferior because 
now we will talk about shrutidhar is it that everybody was shrutidhar or the brahmanas were shrutidhar of course we have the reading in the bhagavata and satyuga almost everybody was of a brahmanical kind of disposition even if they were not in brahmanical occupations but um, it is is it in that sense that it was considered inferior well see overall as we know from um, the bhagavata and from the other scriptures that um, memory intelligence <clears throat> you know strength and all the uh, desirable qualities diminish with the four yugas right yes so in kali yuga today uh, our memory power is extremely diminished as indeed is our strength our intelligence and everything else so yes. if you go back in time uh, we see that there was a progressive uh, increase in the level of the capacity for memorizing the capacity for analyzing perceiving things the power of the senses even you know so in satya yuga for example the first of the four yugas uh, practically everybody must have been like that you know so that's one thing that's the intrinsic nature of the uh, human being in that phase of time in that yuga hmm. but apart from that i think also what has happened is uh, that uh, the oral tradition has been uh, an extremely sophisticated complex uh, organized comprehensive codified structured kind of a system okay. in which uh, things could be passed down and the person who was hearing would hear carefully and repeat and there was certain uh, methods by which uh, let's say mnemonic uh, methods you mnemonics you know um, things that are uh, techniques things, right so yes. incorporated into the oral transmission uh, were um, codes and mnemonic methods uh, by which uh, they could memorize things and there were various levels of such memorization depending on the uh, level of evolution of the student and to the extent that there were even mnemonics that eventually an advanced student could could reproduce something uh, you know forwards and backwards and backwards and forwards okay to that degree the thing was evolved and also there were checks and balances that were introduced into the system so that um, you know in case you made a mistake somewhere then there was a check that if you chanted it another way you would get that you would get caught there so in the sense that it, that mistake would be revealed there so this was uh, um, from many angles there were checks so you chanted it in this way you you use this mnemonic method you use that method and they all checked each other so apart from the fact that people were intrinsically very evolved and they had an innate higher capacity for memorizing and understanding also the fact that the system of transmission and memorization was so developed uh contributed to this plus the emphasis that uh you know sound is divine veda veda is knowledge that all knowledge is ultimately divine so this kind of a, a philosophical understanding of the world so all these factors put together i think have created this um uh, uh, very very uh, sustainable system of uh, transmission of knowledge Hmm. In fact, I I I am told uh, I don't know the details, but I'm told that uh, the UNESCO, you know, the United Nations for Education, Social, Cultural, something organization, right? Yeah. So they have accorded heritage status to uh, the Vedic chants, the process of oral uh, transmission of Vedic chants, like the Uh, some veda yajur veda etc because these chants have remained unchanged for 1000 years or more according to them 
Actually, we know that it's much longer. Yeah. Even from the empirical point of view, they say it is a thousand years. But even that is enormously long. So, you know, to, to continue the fidelity of transmission uh, without changing a single syllable or a single intonation for 1,000 years without a piece of paper, without any recording system, except in the brain, that was something quite uh, astonishing. Yes, I have. Uh, I also read about this, that the, the precision of that replication is is amazing in one sense it stays in the memory of people and they did very systematically trained to pronounce everything very precisely so yes yes so with respect to this i had read about something which is a slight difference between shruti and smriti that this preservation of the sound vibrations was especially done for the shrutis for the rigveda and other such Vedic literature primarily. And the Smritis, because they were recollections, there is of course a tradition of say memorizing Ramayana, not so much the Sanskrit Ramayana, but as more of the local renditions of the Ramayana, vernacular ones and reciting. But that is more in terms of musical recitation. Uh, but uh, the Shrutis seem to, oh, because there is a greater level of unchangeability associated with them, so the, the sound of Shrutis is considered to be, uh, we could say, more essential to preserve. Is there any similar differentiation that is there within our tradition? I know Jiva Goswami says that uh, for us, the Bhagavatam is also like a Shruti. But uh, broadly speaking, it seems Smriti seems to be a little more... Uh, um, malleable in its manifestation. So what what I had heard was that in Smriti, the meaning is more important than the letter. The so sometimes there that's why in say Chakravarti Padina's commentary says in some versions this verse is like this, in some versions this verse is like this. But overall the meaning remains the same. Um, from what I understand, uh, the difference between Shruti and Smriti, uh, apart from the uh, immediately superficial and correct understanding that one is Shruti is that which is heard and Smriti is that which is remembered after having been heard. Uh, you're correct when you say that um, the Shrutis were more, or rather the Puranas and the, and the uh, Smritis were more malleable. Uh, in what sense? Uh, essentially, the Shrutis, like the four Vedas, and to, to a large degree, the Upanishads also, were um, structured in a certain type of, composed in a certain type of language, uh, which was the older type of Sanskrit, uh, which placed a lot of emphasis on Swara, which is the intonation you know, uh, the pronunciation, the intonation, you know, one of the six Vedangas is Shiksha, right? Shiksha means phonetics. Uh, Jyotisha is, uh, you know, astrology, and then Nirukti is etymology, and Vyakaran is grammar, etc. So, um, in this way, the Shiksha uh, was phonetics about how to pronounce the things exactly, so there is a lot of rigidity in the Shrutis about this, especially the four Vedas. Uh, so you have to pronounce things in a certain way. You have to uh, chant things in a certain way. You know. So, um, uh, for example, there is uh, uh, Akshara Shuddhi. You know, hmm. Akshara Shuddhi. Uh, means that you have to pronounce the words, uh, you know, correctly. Uh, so you can't pronounce them wrongly. Uh, then, then the whole thing changes. Uh, the second would be um, matra shuddhi. Matra is the the uh, 
duration for which you hold the vowels you know like, like there's a short vowel the long vowel right so if you change the uh, emphasis if you if you say it for a slightly longer period it's a long vowel right so yeah. in the uh, when when we pronounce it in the modern day age uh, not only do we make mistakes in uh, akshara akshara ashuddhi there is we don't pronounce properly the different uh, alphabets but we also don't have mantra sh- uh, matra shuddhi so for example you know uh, we may say lord narayan yes it's lord narayan okay 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 right? yeah or uh, one thing i used to commonly hear devotees saying is bhakti churu swami where is it is bhakti charu swami right okay so the matra so the the length of the vowels the duration for which you hold is is very important and the third is the swara shuddhi swara is the intonation the pitch and and how you you know uh, recite it and how you place emphasis on certain things so uh, regarding this um, um, akshara shuddhi matra shuddhi swara shuddhi a lot of emphasis is given in the uh, shruti so you have to pronounce things uh, exactly like that you have to intonate in tone the the verse is exactly like that the duration of holding the chants have to be also exactly like that and if you don't do that then the the mantra the power of the mantra is lost right we, we hear so many times shila prabhupad saying that we don't have brahmanas like they used to early because they can't chant the mantras like that and therefore the mantras you know they don't work like that anymore because we don't have all these three factors mm. uh, as far as the vedic mantras are concerned so that emphasis Maharaj, just a little back so we yeah. move forward are there any say english language something uh, just to keep my throat i have to keep sipping something if you don't mind yeah, yeah please please yeah okay. so i was just you like are there any correlates to these three ideas of say akshara matra and swara in english because at one level there are similarities in languages at another level there are differences also so we of course have pronunciation now in english there are rhymes and there is there are poems which are written and there are songs which are sung sometimes poems are can be read as text sometimes they can be sung as songs Uh, overall i notice that the level of sophistication with respect to rules of grammar as well as rules of uh, articulation uh, expression they are much more intricate in sanskrit yes uh, but is there anything similar with respect to the akshara <clears throat> matra and swara yeah these are actually principles that would apply to all languages right let's say akshara means uh, akshara shuddhi refers to the fidelity of pronunciation okay. so in in english uh, we may pronounce uh, the the alphabets differently the words differently isn't it so if we don't pronounce uh, an alphabet properly like for example you pronounce v as b or you know something yeah. like that so yeah some yes, pronounce different. people pronounce m <clears throat> as yam or something like that Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Then you come to matra shuddhi when <clears throat> you're talking about the vowels. Okay. So we may not understand, uh, we may not know the exact uh, which is a long vowel, which is a short vowel. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So, for example, that could yeah. be an example. Sorry. The and D. The yeah. T H E when the E is sometimes. louder sometimes it is less emphasis or would that come in swara yes yeah, swara would be <clears throat> <clears throat> it's not so much in, in english there's not so much of dependency but the intonation does matter for example uh, you tell me uh, uh, you know uh, yeah. let's say were you happy when this happened and i can say was i happy when this happened you know so i i emphasize or i emphasize a certain thing or you say the word i you emphasize the i or you emphasize a certain word and there's a certain 
intonation in which you chant. So the basic uh, principles of these three are found in all languages, but it's just that in Sanskrit, it is far more sophisticated. And I'm also not a Sanskrit expert, by the way, so I want to make that disclaimer. Um, but overall, it's, it is the sophistication and comprehensiveness um, is uh, something unparalleled in the Sanskrit language. Okay. So the point I was making is that in the Shruti, uh, there is a very great emphasis on, on the Akshara Shuddhi, the Matra Shuddhi, and the Swara Shuddhi, while in the Smriti Shastras, also there is some degree of emphasis, definitely. I mean, uh, but it's not of the kind <clears throat> in, uh, that is required for the Shrutis. So to what you said earlier about how there is some malleability or some flexibility in this, uh, in the um, Smriti Shastras is, is correct. <clears throat> For example, the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, what Narad Muni tells uh, <clears throat> Vyasadev, mm. you know, about uh, uh, how one may not be uh, make mistakes in the pronunciation, etc. You remember from first Kento? Yes, yes, yes. I think uh, Prabhupada also <clears throat> there that uh, Prabhupada also emphasizes that further that uh, there is a Tadvag with Sargojanata with Plavo. That yes. was also coming. Yasmin Patishloka Abhidavadhyapi. Yes. Yasmin Patishloka Abhidavadhyapi Naman Yanantasa Yashon Kitani. So because it is the glorification of the Supreme Lord, Therefore, even if there is some discrepancy in the pronunciation or in the matra, or the swara, or the akshara, you know, it's it's uh, it doesn't really matter so much because the genuine mood of devotion to the supreme Lord supersedes these other three. Okay. Right. So, uh, but in the Vedas. In the four Vedas, especially, you know, there's a lot of emphasis was given on these three. And if you made even a slight error, then the whole endeavor was considered spoiled. And sometimes it would even have a reverse effect. Like we see in that uh, pastime in the Bhagavatam where Pashta. Yes. That Pashta, right? Yeah, Pashta. He uh, gave away the offerings of sacrifice to the Asuras and... Um, Indra and the Devas were very happy. And Indra, I think, asked him to leave. And then Twashta was unhappy. And then he performed a sacrifice in, um, in which he said, Indra Shatru Vardhasva. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but because he pronounced it wrong, it had the opposite effect. Now, the word Indra Shatru uh, can have two meanings. It can have uh, meaning as the enemy of Indra, Shatru means enemy, or it can mean Indra who is the enemy. Yes. Right? So, uh, and the difference between the two uh, emerges on the Swaras. So if your Swara, if your Swara Shuddhi is not there, then uh, even though in, you intend to say one thing, you may end up meaning the other thing or saying the other thing with the opposite meaning, right? So, uh, Tvashta intended to say, uh, may the enemy of Indra flourish. Yes. But because his Swara was wrong, so it ended up saying, may Indra the enemy flourish. Right? Yes. So, we find this in the Bhagavatam, right? This pastime of Pashta. Yes, correct. So we see this, how, how important it is in the, uh, uh, you know, the Shrutis. Whereas in the Bhagavatam, it's not really that important. Although we should try to, you know, pronounce correctly and all that. Prabhupada did place a lot of emphasis on this. Yes. Hmm. Uh, um, of course, we know that ultimately Bhava Grahi Janardana, that uh, Krishna ultimately... Uh, looks at the devotion in our heart and that supersedes anything else. Mm -hmm. However, 
So when there is devotion, we do try to do these other things properly also. So Prabhupada took a lot of pain to ensure that the devotees chanted correctly. In one Bhagavatam class in uh, somewhere, I think it was Tokyo, Prabhupada let the entire class just be uh, the recitation, repeated recitation of the verse of the Bhagavatam that was up on the board. So he made everybody recite the verse one by one by one and he corrected them. Yes. In the Lilamrut is mentioned that everybody, like some devotees were spaced out, but everybody had to start focusing because reciting those verses was not that easy for them. Yeah. So yeah. I did emphasize and yeah. And there is a quite a special potency in those verses in the sense that say, if you consider say the Gopi Gita, if we recite the Sanskrit, in contrast, if we read or recite the English translation, no matter how beautiful the translation may be, it is still, uh, there, is, uh, there is some uh, potency which can be very, which can be very tangibly experienced almost. Yes, yes. And Srila Prabhupada uh, gave the analogy of the, of the thunder cloud, you know, of the clapping of thunder. And he said that when when there is the sound of thunder, people all over the world get the message. And there's one reaction in the heart, and that is fear. Uh, So similarly, uh, when the uh, scriptural verses uh, are chanted, even if we don't understand the meaning, it purifies the heart. Because that sound vibration is transcendentally potent. So it has the capacity to purify the heart regardless of whether we understand the meaning or not. Naturally, if we understand the meaning and chant it with devotion, then it is all the more potent. But the point is that even if one doesn't understand, that sound vibration is is so strong that it can purify the heart. Hmm. So, so at one level, when we are talking here about the oral tradition, we emphasize the meaning, but that doesn't mean we completely downplay or dismiss the, we could say the, the means or the, the, the literal aspect of the pronunciation and the language and, uh, and the words. So there is, there is at one level, ritual specialization in itself is important. Now by ritual specialization, I mean the proper pronunciation of mantras and other things. So we don't want to overemphasize it. But at the same time, we can't completely dismiss it also. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. And we see people... Sometimes devotees may dismiss it on the grounds that devotion is more important than anything else. So it is true indeed that devotion is more important than anything else. But if there is devotion, then one would like to do everything one does uh, very carefully without negligence to the best of one's ability. One will really try hard to do that activity as well as possible. Right? For example, if uh, one is cooking for the deities, now uh, one would try, to, because one is devoted, one would try to learn to cook as well as possible and not make any mistakes and try to see that the bhoga that is cooked is as delicious as possible and just uh, you know up to the standard. So one cannot justify uh, negligence or carelessness or lack of effort on the grounds that one is devoted. Well, I am devoted to Krishna, but you know, uh, I won't be careful when I am cooking. Then, then there's no devotion there, right? At least a sincere effort must be there. So similarly, where there is devotion, because the recitation of the Bhagavatam or the Bhagavad Gita is a very important service to the Lord, so one must try to do that as well as possible. 
But for cultural reasons or for any other reasons, if there are very um, se severe obstacles that come in the way of our proper pronunciation, then it's all right. You know, ultimately Krishna sees the devotion, fine. So that's fine. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't put in the effort. Yes. That's the point. We should try to learn correctly how the, uh, the words are pronounced. Yes. And then if you're not able to do it despite our best efforts, then it's all right. Hmm. Yes, Maharaj. So here, the overall theme with respect to the... So the oral tradition, at one level, it says, like Prabhupada had the recitation of the verses as a part of the Bhagavatam class. But simultaneously, there is also the also addition. There is the class, and I mean, if you want to speak something more on the, say, the technicalities of the Sanskrit language, and that aspect of the, that aspect of the oral tradition, you could continue that, or can we shift to the, to the like the message being conveyed through the oral tradition? Sure, sure. Okay. So. No, if uh, say in the, if we consider from the re recent historical perspective, at least from as far as modern historical memory goes, so there has been an increase in writing and reading and publishing that way. Uh, but at the same time, there are several researches which seem to indicate that there is a there is a special import or a special potency in having text read aloud and being heard. So for example, across the world, there is this tradition of parents reading out stories to their children. There is sometimes parents tell stories, but if there are some classic books, whether it is in India and it's a Ramayana or other books on the West, there might be Western classics, fairy tales or whatever, but parents would read out the stories to their children. And now also in today's world, although books are available, Audio books have also become very big in recent times, and uh, so 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 at one level, although the written text is being propagated and is widely available, but still many people naturally default towards the of the audio. So broadly, I think there are three factors. One is with respect to the audio, there is a connect with the person, like say like a say a mother reading out a story to a child there's a personal connection that comes when there is being read aloud and it is being heard second is the accessibility is much more in the sense if you have to sit and read a book it takes uh, more effort but having an audio book means we can hear while doing other things also but apart from that in general for most people uh, it's not the accessibility in terms of uh, the being able to do it at other times, but also in general, human for human beings, hearing is relatively more accessible than reading and studying. So we can say some extent that it's not, hearing audiobooks is not exactly the same as the traditional oral tradition, uh, as the past oral tradition, but there are similar trends which we see in today's world also. Yes, that is because intrinsically the process of hearing is so powerful. It is not without reason that the Bhagavatam and actually all the scriptures, the Shruti as well as the Smriti, emphasize so much on the process of hearing. As I mentioned in the beginning of our discussion that it's not because there was a want of written methods or materials that uh, the emphasis was placed so much on hearing. You know, the emphasis was placed on hearing because inherently the process of hearing was so powerful. And that has to do with the nature of, of sound, transcendental sound, right? So, uh, uh, so Prabhupada called it submissive oral reception. Yes. A-U-R-A-L, submissive oral reception. 
So the tradition is oral transmission, O-R-A-L, by mouth, and submissively receiving it orally, A-U-R-A-L-L-Y, orally. That's so the process... Word, uh, the oral and oral, you thought of it just now or it's, it's very striking. It's uh, oral, the oral tradition received orally. Yeah, therefore, actually speaking, you know, uh, this is called Karna Parampara. Oh, Karna Parampara, okay. This, this whole tradition of, uh, you know, passing down oral traditions are generally called Karna Parampara. Karna means year. And also we see the Brahma in the Bhagavatam in the third canto says, uses the word Shrutekshita, which means that one should see with one's ears. Yes. So transcendence has to be perceived by the ears before it can be perceived through the eyes. So yeah. it is uh, hearing through the ears that uh, gives eligibility to see through the eyes. Yes. So intrinsically, the process of hearing has its potency. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of reading in the modern day because we don't have that kind of capacity for retention of what we hear. So indeed, reading is very useful. And uh, I, I believe that all devotees must read uh, you know, as much as they can. And reading is in a sense a form of hearing as well because the author is speaking. Yes. Uh, however, uh, actually physically sitting down in the association of devotees uh, and hearing some uh, uh, devotees speak uh, from the Shastras is actually the best thing to do. The kind of vibrations there and so on, uh, the atmosphere, you know, the, the overall impact mm. is, is uh, very significant. And even if somebody doesn't know how to read and write, of course, nowadays in the modern world, uh, there are very few people who are actually illiterate. But uh, even if one doesn't know how to read and write, the hearing uh, processes is available to everyone, regardless. That's, that's striking. So what it overall means is that... Uh, in terms of universe, uh, in terms of breadth, we can say that uh, for most people, the oral tradition is going to play a very vital role. Mm -hmm. So I thought of this, you know, now if we consider the modern history of uh, language, they do say that writing has its own utility in terms of providing a more structured form of communication and thought. So writing also has its value. And uh, we could say, at least in today's world, when, when we have the cognitive capacities that we currently have, that maybe the oral tradition can provide greater breadth and the written tradition can provide more, more depth. Because when we read a book, it requires a sustained application of thought. And usually when a person is writing a book also, they put in much more effort in writing than in, uh, than in speaking. Uh, so there can be a much deeper understanding when we study the books. But at the same time, uh, we need both breadth and depth. So probably a, a, more, a larger number of people would be open to the audio aspect. Because nowadays with, say, YouTube and podcasts like we are having, a lot of people are hearing. And even spiritual message, if we can, we are already reaching out. But there is a huge scope for reaching out through that. And at the same time, a systematic study where one reads a book and reflects on the thoughts in the book, that has its own, uh, own place, which cannot be denied. Yeah. I mean, what you say is true from a practical point of view uh, for people in this age. But uh, I think it's important for us to note that the written tradition is important for us, uh, not so much because of some 
uh, inherent uh, value to the process of writing itself there is something obviously there but it's because of our inherent deficiencies it's because we are not able to retain information uh, simply by hearing within our head so therefore the need for the written tradition has uh, arisen right so it is not the written tradition is in and of itself uh, very significant it becomes significant because we are unable to uh, to sustain uh, the oral tradition uh, in our heads to okay. memorize it otherwise everything that you say that can be done in the written tradition can be done and was done in the oral tradition but the people were of such fine intellect and things could be just given in a succinct form and it could be understood without need for elaborate explanation now because of our deficiencies uh, we we can't remember things so it has to be put down and then things have to be explained things have to be put in a certain way mm -hmm. so Uh, therefore while certainly for a practical utility uh, for the, of the written word is is enormous for us and it would be foolish to to deny its importance now so we should utilize it but philosophically i think we can appreciate that essentially the whole written tradition uh, evolved because of the deficiencies of the people of kali yuga which is why vyasadev actually put Uh, dictated the mahabharat to ganesha and then you know yes uh, the whole written thing tradition started from there on yes maharaj right definitely so i was just if we talk about say as devotees appreciating or access, or accessing the oral tradition more now now because of the pandemic we don't have uh, people being able to devotees also being able to assemble at one place for a class but we have class, classes through zoom and through online they're connecting with everyone connecting with people from all over the world so would the same principle apply that earlier you talked about something like this the intrinsic potency and then there is a contextual manifestation of the potency so if it is possible coming for a physical class where there is it's oral tradition but a physical class if it is possible it's always better uh, because it's not just the sound but it's also the atmosphere around it but if that is not possible then there is uh, attending virtually also is is beneficial so in the in the academic ordinary academic sense also uh, there is some concern about how say children if they are learning virtually how much do they actually learn and how much they get distracted in while that learning so now that is at one level an ordinary at a ordinary or a mundane level there is a concern but how, what about spiritual sound and its manifestation in the say with respect to the oral tradition when we are doing it not physically but say virtually digitally i think it has uh a lot of value and uh, it would be very beneficial to avail of its uh, uh you know this facility that's made available to us why not it's an opportunity to utilize the same sound vibration it's just that the medium has slightly changed instead of you know sitting on physically hearing you're hearing over the internet of course um uh, as you have also mentioned there's nothing like actually sitting physically in that assembly and hearing that's the best hmm. uh, but that is not possible for some reason then uh, hearing via the internet reading the books you know all these things are very valuable okay you know just coming back to the earlier point about written tradition and how the need for the written tradition has arisen because of our inadequacy in uh, memorizing things i just remember a small anecdote you know one time i was going somewhere for some ayurvedic treatment to some place uh and because i was going to be there for a month 
I had carried quite a few books with me. So when I was unpacking, uh, there was somebody wh- whom I knew who came in with some, some scholar, a Brahmana scholar. And he saw so many books there. So he said, oh, you're carrying so many books. So I said, yeah, because I'm going to be here. So I thought that I'll you know, read them. So he just he said, smilingly, he said, you know, there's no need to carry books. It should all be here. <laughs> he gestured to the <laughs> prayer and said, it should all be here. Oh, okay. I have to have a, a book. So, you know, that, that's the idea. <laughs> this was and, where, where was this? This was in Udupi somewhere. Udupi, okay. Many years ago, you know, way back. So I still remember that um, I also uh, came across a proverb, uh, you know, long ago about something like this, which is Pustakeshu Chaya Vidya Parahasta Gatam Dhanam Samaya Tu Pariprapte Na Sa Vidya Satadat Dhanam Na Tad Dhanam. So uh, the meaning is Pustakeshu Chaya Vidya. If there is knowledge that is acquired from a Vidya, that is acquired from a book, Pustaka. Hmm. Or if there is dhanam, wealth, parahasta gatam, gatam is gone, and has gone, parahasta means somebody else's hands. Yes. So knowledge that has been transferred into a book that is available in a book hmm. and money that has gone into another's hands, samaye tu pariprapte, with, at the right time, when you need it, na sa vidya, na tad dhanam. That vidya, or that dhana, that knowledge, or that wealth cannot come to your aid when you actually need it. <laughs> because then, uh, even for the wealth, it's gone away to somebody else's hands, so you can't avail of it. And mm-hmm. if that book is not with you, then you can't avail of that knowledge. So if the knowledge is here in the head, then you know it's there with you all the time. You're not dependent on anything outside of yourself. You know, so this, this is essentially the, the, uh, the, the process of, of uh, Vedic education. You know, how uh, there was a lot of emphasis given to memorizing. Of course, nowadays, uh, modern educationists look askance at... Uh, Emphasis on education, on memorization, which they say rote learning. And they have creative ways of education and they try to improve the analytical skills of students and all that. Uh, Personally, I'm all for that. I'm all for improving the analytical skills of students and for devising creative means for students to learn things, children especially. But I disagree with the modern educational philosophy that seems to uh, minimize or trivialize uh, the importance of memorization. And when you dismiss that as rote learning, if there's only rote learning and nothing else, yes, there is some deficiency there. But even that rote learning in, in, uh, at a very young age then it has its benefits because once you, let's say you memorize the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, uh, Bhagavatam at a young age when your power of memorization is very strong and you memorize these things very nicely uh, and side by side, you've been given the samskaras also, you've been given the proper devotion, you've been given the uh, proper physical sensory engagements also by which you can uh, translate that into an experience, not only rote learning, then what you have memorized actually flowers from within. And with uh, time, as one moves ahead and and gains knowledge from the outside world, including from the scriptures, Mm. then that internal memorized knowledge now actually starts uh, transforming itself into realized knowledge. And it, it kind of uh, comes forth, you know. And then when you grow up and you actually start understanding the meanings, it's so easy to pick up. 
and it's flash, you get the whole thing, the realization. And also the process of memorization, it kind of must be stimulating some things there, some finer parts of the uh, memory and the intelligence and so on. And that enables one's intelligence to become finer. Because according to Bhagavatam and the uh, uh, Upanishads as well, uh, memory is one of the components of intelligence. Yes, in fact, uh, this is a beautiful point, Maharaj, about, about the importance of memorization. That in, if you consider that Dhyayato Vishaya and Pumsa verse also, Krishna says, Smriti Brahmashad Buddhi Nasho. So, in one sense, recollection, memory is the foundation of intelligence. So, our intelligence can't really function significantly without having memory within it, without having something within the memory. So, while rote memorization is, uh, is uh, if it, like you said, if it is complemented with something else, even if, even if children are not able to comprehend intellectually at that time, but if it is made into a pleasant experience, uh, then that is, uh, that is stimulating, that is re rejuvenating. And uh, at an older level, I think the problem with memorization comes when it's only done that much and nothing more is done. Hmm. With respect to even in ordinary sense, when children remember, memorize the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or the tables, the idea of speaking aloud and repeating, it has, it has a special potency. And that is the way to memorize. Uh, you know, when you speak aloud and repeat, right? Hmm. Now, I don't mean to say that a person who is gifted uh, with a photographic memory is necessarily very intelligent. That may yes, not be the case. That is true. Definitely. I mean, but <clears throat> uh, memory does have a, a role to play in, in intelligence. And uh, when, as you said, complemented with the other things, it, it can flower out into, into learning, into into making a person who's truly learned, truly scholarly. Hmm. <clears throat> so we could say that memory is not the sole sign of intelligence, but it is a, it is a vital resource for intelligence. A component. Uh, okay. Yeah. Component. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a better way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, It seems overall that uh, if there is memorization in the early ch in the childhood or early times, then that is not just uh, it creates impressions. Like you said, it manifests from within eventually. It blossoms. So there are some skaras that are also created by the effort for effort of memorization and. Uh, I think Prabhupada says in one of his letters that, that children like challenges. If things are presented in a, in a way that is exciting or uh, <clears throat> stimulating for them, then what may seem difficult also becomes exciting. And uh, memorization is... Uh, I found that like what, when you're quoting that verse, Pustakesha Chavidya, Yachaya Vidya, actually memorized verses or memorized uh, we could say thoughts they become very accessible to us otherwise if you say we want to remember Krishna or remember the philosophy how exactly do we remember the philosophy if we have crystallized it in the form of a verse which which and that verse is memorized then say contemplate if you want to remember Krishna's form if we have a verse and we can recite the verse and then meditating on Krishna's form becomes much easier Otherwise, to spontaneously simply close our eyes and try to visualize Krishna's form is not that easy. So, both from a childhood perspective of creating impressions as well as an adult perspective, perspective of cultivating abs devotional absorption, wherever it is possible, memorization is, is quite uh, empowering. Yes. And especially uh, if it is made an enjoyable exercise, 
Uh, and uh, along with that, there are different stories because telling stories is a very important part of the oral tradition. I think that's something we may also need to discuss at some point in our, our discussion today. That storytelling traditions are, are very strong all over the world, right? Even in, in uh, Vedic tradition. So uh, even for uh, ch children at a very, very young age, telling stories is very, very important. So uh, telling stories, pastimes, explaining things, uh, so that even in, when they're in the, in the stage of memorizing everything, they also learn to analyze things, learn to see things in a certain devotional and spiritual light. Then overall, the, 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 there is a comprehensive intellectual, spiritual uh, development of that child. Hmm. You know? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. I think this point about you made of storytelling, it is... Uh, it is multiple levels. At one level, there are directly spiritual stories, but there are other stories also which, which teach some uplifting values. Like in our tradition, there is Shruti Pratyaksha Itiyayam Anumane Shuchatushtayam Pramane Shvanamastad Vikalpaatsa Virajyate In the Uddhav Gita, it said that Iti here. The Itihas is also, there he uses it in the sense of not necessarily the Itihas of Ramayana and Mahabharat, but the general historical tradition. So, we humans broadly are, you can say, storytelling or story hearing creatures. That's what captivates uh, the mind much more than, say, simply raw data or, uh, or you could say, concepts alone. There are information, there are concepts, or you could say, principles. There is something which is more. Uh, information, we could say, is more concrete. Concepts are a little more abstract. And both are important, but information and concepts, if they are woven together in a narrative, then the capacity for, uh, for assimilation, for reception, for, for satisfaction, all of it gets multiplied substantially. Yes, yes. Um, I would say that if you look at oral tradition, uh, as a whole and try to see what categories would come under it. Mm. Uh, I would say, uh, because since you raised this point, uh, we, we are talking now about stories. Uh, uh, so it comes to mind that we can categorize it broadly into two categories. One is a more uh, structured part. And the other is something that is more is, is free flowing. Uh, still, there is some rigor associated with it in terms of the transmission and everything. But uh, the first part, I would say, where things are more structured, more rigid, more codified, is essentially the scriptures. Again, in the Vedic scriptures, you could have two categories. You could have one which is a Shruti where as we discussed earlier, things are very rigidly codified. We talked yes. about the importance of the Aksharas, the Matras and the Swaras. Yes. Uh, and so that's one part, the Shruti. And then in that, another subcategory is the Smritis like the Itihasas and the Puranas where there is a structure there uh, it's considered non-different from the Shruti. Um, at the same time, there is some little um, flexibility that is there. Uh, the Puranas and Itihasas are also considered equal to the Vedas because uh, Jiva Goswami says in the uh, Tattva Sandarbha that the Puranas are so called because they make the meaning of the Vedas complete or Purana. Okay. Purana indicates completing. Yeah. So he gives the example that lead cannot make a gold ornament complete. You okay. need gold to make the gold, or gold ornament complete. Yes. So similarly, if the Puranas 
they make the meaning of the vedas complete or purana that means there must be equality between the puranas and the vedas that means between the smritis and the shrutis okay right so you can't say that uh, the puranas are we don't, we don't we don't consider that as valid pramana or evidence and so on you have to consider that also uh, on an equal footing at the same time there is a distinction also between the puranas on one hand and the shruti shastras on the other hand which is that uh, we briefly discussed that earlier that the strong codification and the emphasis on swaras etc that is found in the shrutis is not so much there in the puranas hmm. but both these categories we put it under the first category of the oral tradition because there is a structure it's called a shastra it's called a scripture hmm. and incidentally when we're speaking of puranas or smritis uh, there is a distinction between the puranas and itihasas also although they may uh, the content is very similar uh, but the puranas refer to uh, you know incidents that happened in uh, along bygone eras generally whereas itihasas are those that are composed uh, contemporaneously that means at the same time for example uh, vyasadev compiled ramayan uh, when ram was still ruling yes valmiki rather valmiki valmiki composed the uh, ramayan after ram returned from lanka after killing ravana similarly vyasadev compiled the mahabharat you know almost at the same time hmm. so they called itihasa iti ha asa as it happened right and the puranas apart from the purana angle there's also very old so uh, so their their histories of long bygone eras so anyway these are subtle distinctions that are part of the oral tradition hmm so that's one category right? the structured category of the oral tradition and the other tradition is what i would call the uh, creative uh, artistic free flowing cultural tradition okay uh, for example in india we have uh, the ram leelas that happen in north india you have the jatras that happen in bengal or you have the yaksha gana in karnataka you know in every language every state in india you will find some such folk tradition uh, you know that uh, perpetuates certain themes that have come down in the oral tradition for for many many years but that obviously is very flexible uh, you know you can have a lot of dramatic and creative license there you can do many things uh, whereas you can't do the same with uh, uh, the first category of the scriptures you have to abide by uh, those scriptures to the letter to the word so therefore in the second category uh, the, the tradition of storytelling etc is there and there's obviously an overlap between the two the two categories because even in the uh, first category of scriptures there are so many stories and it is these stories that essentially have been taken into the uh, folklore okay but part of the folklore is also the word aitihya that you mention and that's one of the 10 pramanas that jeev goswami mentions in the tatva sandarbha and jeev goswami defines aitihya as tradition receive uh, knowledge received from uh, in tradition from unknown sources oh okay which we loosely speaking call folklore okay. you know for example we are all familiar with uh, and the stories past times of krishna and vrindavan that are part of traditional um, braj folklore right Okay. they may not appear in the bhagavatam or any of the puranas or upanishads but they're just some past times that have been transmitted down in oral in the oral tradition for so many generations would this be the same as loka praman what he talks what the person talks about in uh, yeah. uh, bhagavad gita bhagavad samud sindhu 
Yes, yes. It could be equated with Loka Pramar. Yes. yes. Okay. So, Aitihya. However, the important thing the Jiva Goswami says uh, in the Tattva Sandarbha, and Bhaktivinu Thakur also mentions that very strongly in the Jaiva Dharma, is that the other nine Pramanas, Pratyaksha, Numana, Aitihya, etc., all of them, they are not independently uh, sources of evidence. Their value is in how much they are uh, able to, uh, to conform to the conclusions of the uh, Shabda Pramana. So that Pramana, which is in pursuance of the Shabda Pramana, can be accepted. So that folklore, which is in pursuance of or in agreement with, in conformity with um, the Shabda Pramana, that is the first category. Yes, all the scriptures, Shruti and Smriti, that we can understand as authentic. Yes. But if there is some folklore which is uh, deviating from uh, the Shabda Pramana from the first category, then, you know, we would not accept that. Yes. So now here, when you're talking about uh, say creative licenses that are there, uh, to some extent they are essential for making any art form. So at one level, there is there is lit, there is literature in terms of, there are scriptures they are we could say a kind of lit, a type of literature but then there are art forms whether there is a drama or there is dance or even there is a narrative form of story so things have to be made if we are going to make a drama then things have to be made attractive from a not just attractive but they have to be proper according to dramatic perspective also so for example, if you are going to do any, any pastime of Krishna, if you do a drama, it's very difficult to stick only to the dialogues that are there in scripture and make the full drama. There has to be, if you want to have some more of elucidation of character, then we will have to fill in some, okay, this character said this, this character said that. <clears throat> so the oral tradition in one sense has a greater amount of vitality to it because when people speak, when we, we, we write, there's a little more formality in the language. When we speak, there's a little more informality and greater connectivity. So if we consider the vernacular renditions of the epics, like you mentioned about the Ram Lila, uh, then there have been vernacular renditions of the Rama in various parts of the world, parts of India, and even I would say South Southeast Asia at large. So, and they have kept the Ramayana alive. At the same time, there is uh, there are concerns that come up that in the regional retellings, there are some things which are there in the epic, some things are not some, some there, some things are in the original source, some things not in the original source. So, are there some? In one sense, in the written tradition, we could have a significant level of conformity, but once we go into the oral tradition, ensuring conformity becomes a little more difficult. So what would be the boundaries of the creative license that uh, we could consider while maintaining fidelity in the oral tradition? As I mentioned, that is uh, conformity of the essential uh, conclusions and facts with um, the Shabda Praman, the first category. Okay. For example, of the many Ramayans, uh, we can accept uh, there are many things in the other editions of the Ramayans which may not be there in Valmiki's Ramayana. So Valmiki Ramayana is the Mool Ramayana, is the original Ramayana. Uh, so there may be other things, for example, in Kamba Ramayana or in uh, Tulisidas, Ram Charitmanas, etc., which may not be there in Valmiki's Ramayana. But we may still be willing to accept it uh, 
you know, and wholeheartedly, uh, if there is no essential dissonance with what uh, what Valmiki says. Okay. Uh, however, if there's some fundamental uh, deviation, then we would not accept that part. Let's say if there is some impersonalism that is thrown in into the philosophical discussion, or some pastime uh, which which depicts uh, Ram or Sita in a way that Almiki doesn't, and you know is is shall we say a little offensive, then we wouldn't uh, uh, you know consider that bona fide. And even when devotees in ISKCON do dramas, you know, we do give a lot of scope for dramatic license. Let's say uh, the favorite drama that devotees have is about Jagai Madai, you know. And they always bring in some humor and Jagai and Madai being intoxicated and, uh, you know, they make people laugh by the way they act. And so that's just, that's just part of it. Yes. Okay. But essentially, the... It, the facts and the conclusions must not be, um, or rather must be in accordance with uh, Valmiki or with the concerned Shastra. Yes, with the Mula, whatever it is, Mula source. Yes. So both these, both these categories of the oral tradition are important, actually. Uh, because... Uh, the the uh, the other tradition also keeps it alive in the minds of the common person. Hmm. So it it keeps there is a vitality to the tradition that is imparted by the cultural part of the oral tradition. So culture is a very important vehicle for uh, preserving uh, the oral tradition. So culture is a via medium. Mm. So through dance, through drama, you know, through music, through literature. Yes. It is preserved. True. Well, I was also reading about Western intellectual history recently that how did uh, things, how did the West move towards atheism from theism? If you see in the a, the 15th, 17th, 18th century, even the prominent scientists were all theists. So the conventional narrative is that as rationality started increasing, religion was rejected as irrational. The triumph of rationality led to the uh, decline of religion. But, but we see still that religion, but that narrative is challenged by the fact that there is a significant amount of resilience in religion that there are many rational people who consciously turn toward re- rational means scientifically educated people who also turn toward religion. Uh, so what the current historians are saying is that, or at least that's one prominent theory that is coming up that uh, actually religion and spirituality are transmitted through the culture and uh, accompany uh, ac- while scientific rationality spread along with that many other things happened like industrialization happened and the traditional family structure as well as the traditional social societal structures that transmitted religion they got destabilized so when there is a joint family then there is relatively many more channels through which uh, stories can be told to children and religious culture can be transmitted because in one sense if there is a community then there are many sources for the oral tradition to be continued. But as families became fragmented from joint families to nuclear families, from nuclear families to even single parents, then the resources, then the resources available for the oral transmission of uh, religion and spirituality, they went down. So it is not so much. Uh, so if, if atheism has increased and religion has decreased, that's not so much because of the spread of rationality as it is because of the decline of the supportive structures for the spread of religion or for the preservation of religion also. So I I think one of the significant supportive structures would also be the oral tradition. So, you know, not only if there are smaller families, not only the parents don't have time to uh, spend with their children, 
so much but even parents don't have time to take the children to temples or church this was more in a christian context to churches so the oral tradition is quite important that's being noted even by historians now yeah no, it is it is extremely true that uh, the crumbling of the family structure has also drastically and adversely affected uh, the transmission of oral traditions undoubtedly and uh, i would say that the reason for that is uh, not so much rationality because that's a debatable question about what constitutes rationality i would say it is materialism the onset of uh, strong materialism intellectually phrased uh in very powerful ways and which found expression in technology um that materialism has contributed to uh the decline of traditional systems overall uh, hmm so not that there aren't any bad things in the tradition uh, the wrong things have also been passed down unfortunately so we need to separate the wheat from the chaff and uh but the, so along with the bad things the good things have also been thrown out mm. so because of the lack of the family structure now the earlier tradition of the grandparents you know sitting with the children telling them the stories making them sit on the lap and you know all of that is gone now they are more of nuclear families and broken families so that whole system is gone and even in the schools now everything has become so secularized right yes. uh, that you, you can't tell any stories any more of this sort at least you can only carefully tell the secular stories but you can't tell any <laughs> of the scriptural stories so overall i think it is materialism that is the culprit okay yes yeah, so in one sense materialism is telling its own stories so if we consider advertisements in one sense they are fairy tales of materialism people may dismiss uh, so modern skeptical people may say that in the past people believed fairy tales involving all kinds of unbelievable be entities but today also much of advertisement is not really grounded in fact it's creating a fiction associated with certain product and it's very sophisticatedly created fiction so precisely materialism as you said two things presented intellectually and then propagated technologically those two things they are and uh, we could also say that the whole culture has also become materialistic so it is also very widespread at a cultural level in fact not only at a cultural level it's glamorized at a culture not just present but not just prevalent but also glamorized so yes yes i think that would be a difference between say one or two generations before and say the generation that are coming now in the past at least there was some deference toward some higher values so toward tradition even if there might not be personal follow dedicated following but at least okay this is something which is good this is something to be venerated but even that is getting lost now yes so nothing remains sacrosanct yes uh materialism what it does is it creates a ground for for intellectual rejection of uh the sacred space and it facilitates the um irreverential attitude hmm uh true i think one one I think one famous uh, atheist he said that and he is talking about the theory of evolution he said evolution made it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist so in one sense we could say science and technology and they can be used as tools 
for justifying one's own ideology in this case the ideology of materialism so yeah. yes maharaj so just going back to our earlier point about uh, the oral tradition so what are the ways in what do you think are the ways in today's scenario uh, we as we can play our part in both preserving and uh, propagating the oral tradition any thoughts or if you have any other i thought this could be like more of a we could go toward a conclusion or if you have any other thoughts we can discuss those also yeah i think the first thing for us is to realize why the oral tradition is important hmm uh, i i i don't mean to uh, say that we should discredit or stop the written tradition because that's going to be there for the rest of this age till the next satya yuga comes and that's going to be a long time away uh but what i am saying is that there is need for us to appreciate the importance of the oral tradition vis-a-vis the written tradition for example um uh, one of the problems with the written tradition is that the written evidence can get destroyed <laughs> by fire by uh, you know uh, floods or whatever you know there are they are for all physical tangible things and uh, even if you have more sophisticated uh, methods of information storage like cloud storage and all that ultimately it's all dependent on technology and the network and uh, so if that collapses then all your knowledge is lost you know everything is lost whereas knowledge that is in the head and that's passed on from student to student and is kept in the head uh, is not dependent on anything external like some material some tangible objects or some technology or anything of the sort so it's actually the safest way to perpetuate and preserve knowledge although now uh, as i said then uh, fine we'll we'll preserve things in uh, in written form in whatever way the written form manifests with technology but this is one important thing uh, another aspect of the written tradition is that of the oral tradition rather is that um, not everything can be conveyed in writing um mm. for example uh swaras you know just coming back to that the intonation you have to actually teach somebody by speaking that person has to hear and repeat it the the karna parampara has to happen if you just simply have a a book that speaks about how the swaras have to be intoned and so on then uh, you can't learn it like that true so the oral tradition uh, contains those elements of learning and education which uh, cannot be transmitted uh, in the written format you know so these are some important things and the third thing is that the importance of transcendental sound vibration uh the next point is that uh you know it it has a potency and that is why the sages of your uh preferred this method to transmit the knowledge and because of the checks and balances uh, there you know it was preserved in fact it was preserved more like that than in the written format see for example in the last several centuries what has happened with many of our scriptures whether it's mahabharat or whether it is manu samhita the much reviled manu samhita you know actually more than half of the manu samhita is it consists of interpolated verses interpolated means that more than half yes uh, many verses have been added you know at some point similarly there are many verses in the mahabharat that have added and this is because of the written version because the checks and balances in the written version are difficult to maintain and identify uh, over a period of time whereas in the oral tradition the mnemonic methods were so sophisticated 
and everything was transmitted down uh, through a chain of, of uh, self-realized sages. So there was intellectual and spiritual integrity there. There was uh, intellectual or uh, capability there also. So there was fidelity of transmission. You know, therefore, iti shushrama dhiranam yenas tad vichachakshire, right? Mm-hmm. Ishupanishad. Yes. So this thing, or shushrama dhiranam, I, which a chakshire, I have heard this shushrama as was explained, which a chakshire, by the dhiranam, by those who are saintly, sober people. So the tradition, the oral tradition was maintained by uh, saintly people who were very evolved. Hmm. So apart from the checks and balances inherent in the whole a structure, the level of integrity and capability and spiritual evolution of the main transmitters of the knowledge ensured that the uh, authenticity of the information transmitted was maintained. Whereas in the written tradition now, you could always change an edition the next time you could, and then after 10 years, uh, people will forget what was the original edition and what was there before, you know, because you're relying on something that's outside of you. So uh, that has its problems associated with it. You know, so there are, there are factors like this that we can consider. So to answer your question of what we should do to preserve the oral tradition, I would say the first thing is to, to appreciate and recognize the importance of the oral tradition vis-a-vis uh, the written tradition for reasons that I uh, just mentioned. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, the yes, second thing one question is, is before yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, in what way are the checks and balances more in an oral tradition than in the written tradition? Because if you consider from today's perspective, say, if say somebody speaks something in a class, you know, we can always have here say what was spoken, what was not spoken, unless we have an audio recording. But uh, a written is something, somebody has written something in a book, then it can be read, it can be seen in context. In general, if we consider in court of law, the written word is, uh, say, written, if we consider slander or uh, there, is, okay, there is a case for slander, then something which is published, something is put in written form, is considered to be a much graver offense than something which is just spoken. Although, of course, spoken is also serious. So, in my understanding, actually, Checking for uh, for fidelity would be easier when something is written because it is much more objectively documented. Um, on the other hand, if somebody spoke something and but it is lost in the ether after it is spoken. So how would the oral tradition, in fact, from what I read from the historians of religion, they said that the oral tradition, allowed for a greater level of fluidity. Whereas uh, it is a written tradition that brought in greater amount of rigidity. Now, of course, the words can be different. It can be, but how does the oral tradition, because if there is say one Gurukul or one Matha, from that Matha to Mathadipati to their followers, there could be accurate transmission. But if you want standardization across uh, a vast uh, terrain, then who is going to actually monitor things if they are not written down? Or are you saying that it doesn't have to be like a universally standardized, but at least locally, it's easier to maintain fidelity? I am not advocating a rejection of the written tradition. Hmm. Uh, But my reason for not rejecting the written tradition is not because of its inherent strengths. Uh, Those inherent strengths arise only because, as I mentioned earlier, of our deficiencies in this age. And therefore we think that uh, the written word has more sanctity or more authority than the spoken word. But in the early days, 
even we say 100 years ago in business also prabhupada said one time the written word once spoken by a trader to another tra- trader that i'll buy this much from you at such and such price was always honored barring the you know uh, occasional crook but otherwise it was honored mm. so because we have reached a certain time where you know we don't trust each other anymore we have lost so many of our qualities so the written uh, word becomes sacrosanct but today even the written word is not sacrosanct actually there are so many court cases that go on despite things being in writing right <laughs> mm. even when you put things down in writing it still happens people still fight about it and say no 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 i, I wrote it under duress or you know this happened or they give some other spin to that thing that they said there at that time you know so the point is that not everything every word spoken by somebody has to be repeated naturally everywhere like shukadev goswami spoke a lot of additional words when he spoke to the sages at naimisharanya because not only did he speak what shukadev goswami spoke but he also added to that right okay nigama kalpa tarur galitam palam palam shuka mukhad amrita dravya samyutam so that shuka mukhad amrita dravya samyutam is that it becomes sweeter when shukadev goswami passed on the bhagavatam to the sages of naimisharanya uh, suta goswami uh, shukadev goswami and then further suta goswami to the sages of naimisharanya so from vyasadev there was a bhagavatam and shukadev spoke it it became sweeter so the idea is that when there are iti shushrama tiranam yonas yenas tat vicha chakshire so when there are such uh, saintly souls who are the main transmitters of of such information then that ensures that the essential facts and conclusions are transmitted and even if there is an uh, something different it is an elaboration of the same that is consistent with the original body of teachings and therefore that elaboration is also considered one with the original teachings so that is how the oral tradition has also expanded so the bhagavatam that we see today is far different from the bhagavatam spoken by vyasadev to uh, you know to narad muni hmm right uh, or rather vyasadev to madhvacharya or narad muni to vyasadev like that so um that was the way the fidelity was preserved today we have come to the stage where we are forced to rely on a written word because of integrity problems and because of uh, lack of ability to memorize to remember things but then okay. at a practical level uh, i think we should have both yes we should have a blend of both um certainly uh we can preserve the written tradition but we must encourage the oral tradition simultaneously and by the way another problem with the written tradition is that the scripts and the words and the languages and the meanings keep changing with time for example the original sanskrit script that is very hard to decipher so it is with the other languages words change the meanings change the scripts change so that is another problem with uh, uh the written transmission wouldn't that apply to the oral transmission also because in one sense written and the language when it changes both its written form changes and the oral form also changes no oral doesn't change oral you're maintaining the whole like the the four vedas for example they remain the same exactly the same mantras are being chanted today oh. after thousands of years it's exactly the same mantras the okay. script for writing those mantras may have changed okay okay makes sense but the words have not changed similarly with the shrimad bhagavatam hmm okay i was talking more from a general language perspective hmm. because the written and the in general language say for example if you consider english or hindi or marathi if you consider chaitanya charitamrut also the bengali of chaitanya charitamrut 
is different from the bengali that is there to Beng- that is spoke bangla that is spoken in bengal today yes so so in one sense in a uh, in the terms of say we could say ordinary or vyavaharik uh, level both the spoken and the written language change but when it you're talking about shruti yes the sound will remain the same yes i agree yes. actually yes. there is a certain interesting uh, feature about books like the chaitanya charitamrita because they kind of straddle both worlds they straddle the world of the scripture and the world of the common man interesting generally the scriptures were in a certain level of sanskrit only but what uh, let's say narottam das thakur did or bhaktivinod thakur did or krishna das kaviraj goswami vrindavan das thakur they presented things in a language that was easily understood understandable to the common person in their dialect in the vernacular so and there is no problem with that that is also essential hmm right but let's say 200 years down the line the bengali language would have changed even more <laughs> yes yes so there is no problem in elaborating on uh texts uh in whatever language they may have been so long as the fidelity is maintained yes that's true so the way the oral tradition can be maintained this uh, in addition to uh, maintaining the written tradition now is for example every day parents should tell or grandparents should tell uh, stories to the children they should in uh, from childhood uh make them learn different things apart from telling stories and and uh, uh encouraging them to think and analyze they should also encourage their ability to memorize things so that by the time they're of a certain age they've memorized the bhagavad gita they've memorized many many verses of the bhagavatam and many essential other things to verses etc things of that sort yes makes sense and even modern psychologists uh, they agree that a human being tap only a very small percentage of the resources of the brain yes number 1 and number 2 that in childhood uh, the capacity for memorizing is enormous and that a child can learn many languages in childhood i forget how many languages exactly that particular uh, research study said but it was quite a bit it was not two or three it was you know a pretty large number uh so apart from um uh, stories and verses uh one should also teach them languages in childhood because they can learn words vocabulary and everything very quickly so ed- uh, language learning should be a very important part of education and it's part of the oral tradition spoken language and incidentally that is how children learn languages you know it's, it's very interesting as part of the oral tradition if you study the way chil- we have all learned languages you know we learned essentially by hearing hmm so when you are much older in age you can certainly learn new languages but it's not as easy as when you were a child you just learnt it spontaneously just by hearing how does an infant or a baby learn languages the baby doesn't understand intellectually something but just by hearing you know it it learns yes and then it says it again and then therefore the whole shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam you know the sequence of shravanam kirtanam and smaranam it's not a coincidence that uh, prahlad maharaj mentions those three in that sequence because shravanam or hearing comes first when you hear you repeat so that was a traditional method of oral transmission the guru would speak the disciple would repeat the guru would speak the disciples would repeat many times and by hearing and repeating hearing and repeating it would be memorized in different ways so the shravanam kirtanam and smaranam sequence is very important 
That's beautiful. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam. Mm. This is very directly correlating with the sequence that Prahlad Maharaj describes, but that is also the way we, we actually assimilate things. So, yes. you know, one last point maybe about memorization and remembrance of Krishna. At one level, um, reading, reading helps us to gain absorption. Hearing also helps us to gain absorption. But in general, if you, our ultimate purpose and perfection in bhakti is to remember Krishna. So to some extent, for remembrance, a certain level of memory is required. It may not be factual memory in terms of facts and figures, but it can be a more personalized memory or a more emotional, emotionally centered memory. But in ultimate sense, when we talk about a devotee being absorbed in the remembrance of Krishna, or pure devotees being completely absorbed in the remembrance of Krishna, uh, that remembrance, it comes primarily through sound, like Shruta Yikshita Patha, as you quoted earlier. So it comes uh, largely through the contemplation on the sound and the relishing of the sound that eventually that absorption comes, isn't it, Maharaj? When we speak of remembering Krishna, uh, we always speak of Krishna in all his various manifestations, right? Yes. What do we mean when we say Krishna? Uh, you know, to quote uh, a phrase that Prabhupada quoted, mentioned so many times, his name, fame, form, pastimes, paraphernalia, abode, right? His teachings, yes. everything constitutes Krishna. They're all different manifestations of Krishna. So when we want to develop love for Krishna, we develop love for Krishna in all these manifestations. So these, uh, so relating to these different um, aspects of Krishna will facilitate love. Now, uh, so in childhood, when one is taught the Bhagavad Gita verses or the Bhagavatam verses, uh, so certainly that is uh, Krishna himself. Those verses are not different from Krishna. And side by side, when the children are taught to um, see and recognize, appreciate and love Krishna in his other manifestations as well, in the holy name, the deity, the pastimes, right? In the form of prasadam and so many other things, then whatever memorization they do uh, mm. will actually uh, flourish and evolve and blossom into something very meaningful and deep as they grow older it will become a one, it, it will become one integrated uh, whole okay makes sense so ultimately there are multiple resources that contribute to that, uh, that cultivation of consciousness. And the oral tradition is one very valuable part, although it sometimes may be undervalued. But we don't want to absolutize anything. We want to leverage or optimize all the resources that are available for us. Yes, yes. At the end of the day, our goal of life is to love Krishna, become pure devotees of Krishna. And... Whatever helps us to do that, we are happy to do that. Yes, Maharaj. And because the oral tradition has its enormous benefits, we don't want to reject it. We don't want to see it lost. We will utilize the benefits of the written tradition, but we do not want to utilize, lose the benefits of the oral tradition. Yes, Maharaj. It's beautiful. Should I, should I try to summarize Maharaj what he spoke or would you like to add yeah. some things? To uh, no, I think not. You can summarize. Yeah. I think it was a quite a broad discussion we had today about uh, the importance of the oral tradition. So we started by talking about how for us to understand scripture, we hear, we read books, we hear classes. Often hearing and reading both together can lead to deeper assimilation. 
and in that context you mentioned uh, how within our tradition the oral tradition is uh, was a was a, always a valuable vital part that even academic historians have noted how for thousands and thousands of years the recitation of vedic mantras with an inc- incredible amount of precision it happened because of this oral tradition and then we talked about the akshara akshara itself means imperishable so in that context we discuss the fact that at one level all sound is intrinsically tra- uh, transcendental energy at another level depending on the consciousness of the person and the utilization uh, for what purpose it is being utilized the transcendence will become manifested and uh, then you talk about especially in the shruti we have the the shuddhi of the akshara the swara uh, and the matra 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 so at one level this is there in all languages but in sanskrit because it is connected with the lord so a higher potency is manifested and so we also talked about if we consider the itihasas and the puranas at one level so there is a there is a rigid or you could say there is a very accurate replication in the shrutis but that doesn't mean the smritis have to be downplayed the smritis are also valuable in their own way and that very striking example of jiva goswami that the purana is that which makes purna the complete then it has to have some non difference from what it is completing lead can lead cannot complete a golden ornament so in that sense the there is there is a certain level of certain kind of equality within the smritis and the shrutis and the itihasas while the puranas talk about diverse events even from the past puran as in the past pura what happened in the past as itihas is more in one sense contemporary both ramayana both valmiki and vyasadev are parts of the book that they are writing so as it is happening or as it is recently happened and then uh, with respect to the oral tradition we talked uh, you talked about how sometimes it is uh, minimized or trivialized as rote memorization but uh, memorization has its own value especially for children memorizing if it is made into exciting challenging they have extraordinary capacity to memorize things and even learn several languages as you mentioned later so if that if memorization is not made like a intellectual burden but it is made like a cultural experience then it can lead to lead to deep impressions which will flower in the future and that knowledge can eventually be assimilated very 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 easily so uh, even for for us uh, as ad, for us adults if something is memorized then it is become more accessible you quoted that subhajit pustakeshu uh, that wealth in a wealth which is elsewhere or knowledge in books is not as easily accessible as something which is with us so while memory is not the sole sign of intelligence memory is a is a vital component is a of intelligence and uh, when we talk about uh, memorization we do, we don't have on to at one sense uh, either accurate pronunciation or a lot of extensive memorization these are not essential for devotion krishna can manifest independent of these but that doesn't mean we we dismiss them to the extent that it is possible we we utilize them just like when we are cooking for krishna we try to do the best that we can although different people may have different levels of expertise in cooking so similarly different people may have different levels of expertise in memorizing or uh, pronouncing but we shouldn't uh, trivialize it and then with respect to the role of the written word in today's world it is uh, it is in today's world definitely written word is written word is has its value and um, that is not whereas in modern historian con- historical context it is seen as a sign of progress that we recited writing down but from a vedic perspective it is a, it is somewhat a sign of decline that we lost the capacity to assimilate and recollect internally and that's why we need external resources and the written word is an external resource 
so uh, this external resource is because today it is valuable say the spoken word in the past had a lot of value people would lay down their life to honor their word but when that doesn't happen today we need written documentation and even that people try to circumvent so it's a it's a say we could say both a intellectual and a moral decline that is there in today's world uh and so we recognize the importance of the written word in today's world but at the same time the oral tradition is vital and then you talked about two strands of the oral tradition one is broadly the shruti which is which is exact replication and the other is the cultural artistic creative aspect through drama through poetry through like the ram leela on in varanasi the jatras in aurisa the first category includes shruti and smriti oh okay shruti and smriti okay right. and smriti and the second is the more loose culturally expressed uh, folklore and dance and drama and okay. that like right, that right, right. yeah, yeah. loka praman and ishe shabda praman includes both so we mentioned that the other pramanas like the aiti here that we accept its validity to the extent it is in broad conformity with with the with scripture with shabda so there is a lot of room for artistic license when in dramas are being enacted but at the same time the essential message has to be preserved and uh, we talked about how this oral tradition is is not just say through temples and sadhus giving classes but it's in the homes in families parents and grandparents telling stories so across the world storytelling has been an important part of transmission of culture and in our tradition there are scriptural stories and then there are stories which are of values which are in conformity with scriptures and uh, so what we what can so with respect to fidelity there is no system there, there can be no foolproof system for maintaining fidelity if there is no integrity among people but broadly speaking uh, when there is a higher level of integrity among people then the oral tradition ensures a greater greater it has a greater check balance system and when mahabharata and manu samhita they have become interpolated that's because of that uh, loss of the oral decline in the oral tradition and uh, then with respect to preserving in today's world first we have to appreciate the oral tradition and then we try to continue it in in our own ways in our families in our social circles telling stories and encouraging shravanam kirtanam smaranam so we hear verses recite verses memorize verses recite hear the stories recite the stories and internalize the stories and in that way we draw on various resources for increasing our connection with and our absorption in krishna so the oral tradition has been a invaluable resource throughout history and we shouldn't we should not undervalue or lose it in today's world and you talk about contemporary ways in which it is happening also say like virtually in today's world through technology we are having the oral tradition we are having podcasts and audio books so these are also mediums that we as devotees can tap in keeping the uh, the kar- the karana parampara as you said the the tra- trans- so oral and oral so the oral tradition is is received through oral reception and that's how we can also continue this beautiful tradition any concluding points maharaj or anything i left out uh, that is an excellent summarization the recapitulation of all the points i think that's nice thank you maharaj for your time and your association and i look forward to having your online future also sometime It's so wonderful being with you as always, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, and especially on such a nice topic. It's a beautiful topic. Yes, Maharaj. And I think very important for all of us. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.